Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to convene this daily conversation around all things COVID. We talk about various aspects of the pandemic, including the health, financial, and inequality crises. But we also look at politics and various industries and how they're coping. Tonight, we have a special Friday night episode of The Joy of Reading. Marva Hinton is our guest, our special guest for a special topic. She's the host of the Read More podcast, in which Marva interviews authors about their work and the books that have shaped them as writers. We'll discuss what she's learned, what she's reading, and what the state of books is during the pandemic. Please tag and share with your friends right now. They can join us live or later. And please tell us what are your favorite books? What are you reading during the pandemic? We would love to know. And you will meet Marva in just a minute. Hi, everyone. I'm Sri. Thank you so much for being here. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism and the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. Our motto, don't cancel your event without talking to us. Don't even plan your virtual event without talking to us. You can find my email address right here. We've done events for 50 people and 100,000 people. I bet your event is somewhere in between. So please email. We love to geek out and talk to you about what's possible and what's not in the world of virtual events. If you're joining us here for the first time, in our first 200 episodes, we've had more than a million viewers, 148 million social impressions, 357 guests, 208 of them women, from 67 cities and 19 countries, including the chief scientist of the World Health Organization. Our archives are all on youtube.com slash Srinet. Please give us a subscribe when you can. And we're in partnership with Scroll Global and Scroll.in. We're able to do this because of our awesome sponsors and our awesome producers, Rose Horowitz31 on Twitter and Vandana Menon on Twitter, Vandana underscore Menon on Twitter. Please connect and follow them. Let's tell you also what's coming up because it's a Friday night. We often do a Saturday morning show so that our producers get Saturday night off. So let's tell you what we have coming up on Saturday morning. We have a show with Lauren Freyer will be here. Lauren is the uh, New York, sorry, the India correspondent for NPR, and she'll be here at 9 a.m. Eastern. So you don't want to miss her. That's at 9 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. And then on sa Sunday night, we do our very special episode about art healing the world. And we're going to learn about the Asima and Friends of Asima auction by Entrepreneur. And you'll meet Grace Cho, Dilber Parak, and Christine Biancheria. So watch for that. And we also have a great event that we are producing and partnering with called the IA, the Impact Summit 2020. And that's Saturday, October 10th, tomorrow from 1 to 4 p.m. Among the speakers are Mina Harris and Vanita Gupta talking about civil rights. And we will also have the four South Asian members of Congress, Ami Bera, Pramila Jaipal, Ro Khanna, and Raja Krishnamurthy will all be here. They're just among the 30 speakers from 1 to 4 p.m. It is all free. You can access it. Just register on the link you see on your screen right now on the bottom right, iaimpact.org slash summit, iaimpact.org slash summit, 1 to 4 p.m. Free event with fabulous speakers. You don't want to miss it. Now, are you ready to talk about books? There are some of the books that I've looked at this summer and read and talked to you about, and we'd love to hear about your interest and what you're thinking about with books. And remember, we're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. So tag your friends right now so that they can join us. And let me bring on stage Marva Hinton. She is the host of the Read More podcast, and she's going to tell me, among many other things, how she finds to do all, how much, how she finds time to do all this reading. So please welcome Marva. Hi. Hi, Sri. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for being here. Well, I say I'm great, but you know, I like to say I'm great compared to with everything going on. You know, we you have to take all the blessings you can get given the state of the world 
And uh, that brings me to my first question is always, how are you? Where are you? And how has you, or your family been handling the pandemic? Well, I'm doing all right. You know, as you said, you have to take your blessings where you can. Uh, my family lives in Miami-Dade County in South Florida. And uh, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, we've had had it pretty bad uh, with the virus in this area. So for us, it's just been about being as safe as we can and still staying in as much as we can. Um, my husband and I are both very fortunate in that we can work from home. So we're able to do that. Uh, I'm a freelance journalist and an editor in addition to being a podcast host. Uh, my husband is an IT consultant, so that's something he can easily do from home. Uh, we have two kids, a six-year-old daughter who is in first grade and a two-year-old son. So we stay busy. Yeah, that, they, that sounds like a handful there. Yes, very much so. And what has it been like in your community with the with the uh, virus? What has it been like in your neighborhoods and, and further than that? Well, it's interesting because I feel like my family is taking the virus very seriously, but I'm not sure if everyone else is. Um, we still see a lot of people doing gatherings. Like where we're, we live, for example, we're very close to a community pool. So I can just look out and see the, the um, gate surrounding a community pool. And they're just, sometimes there are just a lot of people out there. I mean, it's still, South Florida, it's still really warm here. So that's not unusual, but it's just, when I see people doing that and, and my daughter's asking me, well, why can't we go to the pool and why can't we, you know, do X, Y, or Z? It's hard to explain. Well, I, we just don't feel like that's safe right now to be around that many people um, who are, you know, are not in the household with us. So that has been a challenge explaining that to her. She has some friends who've gone back to school, but we're still keeping her at home um, doing online learning. And so that was another difficult conversation just to say, some of your friends will be going back, but we don't feel like it's right for you to go back just yet. And that, and it's so hard for them to understand. I have 17 year olds and uh, they turned 17 during the pandemic. And of course they find it difficult too, as well at a, at a different level. Right, yes. I mean, I, I'm sure your teenager at least can understand it. Uh, the six year old, we just say there's a, a bad virus going around you know, people are getting sick. And so we want to keep you as safe as possible to explain why certain things are off limits right now. Boys, I wish someone would talk like that to President Trump. He could have maybe understood what was going on if you just talked in that tone to him. Maybe our whole course of this uh, pandemic would have been different if he just understood. As we would explain to a young child, this is why we're here. This is what we need to do instead. He himself became a super spreader. We're going to try to keep politics out of tonight okay. so that we can talk about books and the joy of reading. And uh, tell us about your podcast, the Read More podcast. You can't be more clear about the <laughs> about what your podcast is about. So tell us uh, how you decided to do that and uh, a little bit more about it. And we'll show folks the podcast as well. Well, it started for me about five years ago. I come from a radio background and in 2015, I actually decided to leave my position in public radio here in South Florida and to go off to be a freelancer. Uh, at that time, I just had one child and it was, I was working the early morning shift. So I was going in to do uh, morning editions of super early and I just decided to try something different. Um, I've always loved reading. I mean, my mother sort of instilled that uh, in me. She she loved to read. And so I've always found authors fascinating and I love to interview authors. And so I decided, why not do that? Um, also, the show primarily features writers of color uh, because, as you know, the publishing industry is uh, a very... Uh, white industry. It's not very diverse. And sometimes it seems like these writers don't get their due. And so I like to feature them, especially uh, young writers uh, just starting out. Although I've also had some very experienced and very well-known writers on the show as well. That's, uh, that's great to 
know that that's the start of it. So how did you put that together? Of course, it's almost no fair. You already have this great radio background. Uh, so how did you manage to take that experience and pull together your own podcast? Well, I had contacts in the Miami area from working here for several years. And so I was able to lean on them to help me. We have a large book fair here every year, the Miami Book Fair International, which is each November. Um, this year, of course, it's gonna be an all virtual event uh, due to COVID. Uh, but the people I knew from the fair, I was able to reach out to them and say, hey, I have this idea to do a podcast. I mean, can you help me? And my first guest was Edwige Dantica, who I knew from my uh, career in radio. And so I was able to go up to her, you know, a big name writer and say, hey, I'm starting the show. Would you come on it? And she was nice enough to say yes. And so she was my first guest. And since then, she's been on a couple more times. And I just... I guess it comes from being a journalist. I don't mind approaching anyone or reaching out to their publicist and saying, hey, I'm doing the show. I'd love to have you on. And most of the time, you know, people are very nice and they will say yes. I mean, before the pandemic came, I was doing all of my interviews in person just because I feel like the sound quality is so much better. Um, but with COVID, I had to, you know, start doing these uh, by phone. But I've had um, a lot of success with getting people on and, and, getting to meet some really cool people and talking to them about their work. Uh, another thing that helped me is there's a very large independent bookstore in the Miami area called Books and Books. And so that brings a lot of authors into Miami. And so that would, I would kind of look at their schedule and see who they have coming up and see if I could reach out and say, hey, while you're in Miami, can I talk to you about your book? That is so cool. One of the things that obviously I'm seeing here is such a great diversity in the kinds of folks you have, and they're not always the kind of folks you see in many of the podcasts or the video interviews and things like that. So talk about why that is important to you, please. Well, I just think it's representation is so important. I mean, I, I think back to when I was in school and it was very rare to be assigned to read an author of color. I mean, I, I was thinking back when I was in high school, um, I don't remember ever being assigned a read more podcast. Of, that's all right. I don't remember ever being assigned a, a writer of color to read. I, I remember there was a project where I could choose and I believe I chose to read something by James Baldwin, but that was not, it was never just like all class reading. So you know how most high schools will read to Kill a Mockingbird, or you'll read, um, uh, I'm, I'm just drawing a blank here, but uh, of the, those typical high school novels, and never, never a black author. Um, Toni Morrison, for example, is my absolute favorite author, and I didn't read her in a class until I went to college. I didn't get that chance in high school. I have some nieces now who are in high school, and they tell me that that is changing at least where they are. They're getting a little bit more diversity. So that's that's a start. So you you feel like you're being able to do this would be making up in part for all the time that you didn't get to do this uh, when you're growing up. Definitely, and it's also just what I like to read. I just feel like I learn so much from reading about um, or reading books by authors from different cultures. Um, I'm in South Florida where there's a very large uh, Latinx population and I didn't grow up in that type of environment. I mean, I grew up in a small town in North Carolina. Uh, there were, at that time when I was growing up there, there were no Latinx people there. Um, there was, uh, the little town I lived in, there was one Asian family and everybody knew them because they were the only Asian family in town, you know? So it, it, I just feel like it helps to broaden your horizon so much to read about people who are different, whose experiences are completely different from yours. Um, and I think everybody should get that opportunity. And so many people kind of keep their reading in a box. They don't like to venture forth, but I think it's 
such a great opportunity to learn and to just have more empathy. I mean, I know there have been studies that show the more you read, the more empathetic you are to others. And I, I think that's definitely something that we could all use. And I would certainly believe that. Uh, tell us about this wonderful drawing you have. Well, that drawing, um, I met an artist here in the Miami area. There's a, a small publisher here called Mango and uh, she worked for Mango Publishing and she uh, was kind enough to do this for me. Uh, that's supposed to be me there surrounded by books. And uh, that was just a, a, a fun project. And I appreciated her doing that because that is not my skill set. <laughs> Uh, I'm not, um, in that way, I'm not artistically inclined. And so that was her uh, rendition of me sitting on a pile of books. Now, how close is this to reality? How, how often do you get to sit among all your books? Or do you have to keep cleaning up and putting things away since you tell that to your kids all well, the time? Well, you know, it's interesting you say that. Um, we moved, my husband and I moved from one part of Miami-Dade County to another part right in the middle of the pandemic. And I still have a lot of my books are actually in boxes right now. And so I, I will not show you uh, what it looks like in front of me where I have, I have a lot of uh, books just stacked up um, <laughs> on the desk because there's my TBR uh stack is always really fat and uh i the tbr is to be read yes uh, yes, I, yes i didn't even know i was it. guessing yeah. <laughs> yes it is and so i have you know i'm in preparation for guests coming on the show i've got a lot of books and also just books that i'm reading on my own for interest so and of course with the kids i, I now i'm surrounded by books for the kids for uh you know my six-year-old she's reading now and so she's got all her books my uh, two-year-old, he likes to uh, read. Uh, so he has, it's very funny to see a two-year-old sit down and, and, and uh, pretend to read. He loves to do that. So I've got all the little um, books for him as well. So, and, and my husband also, he's also a reader. He tends to like to read uh, nonfiction a little bit more than I do. And I tend to go more towards fiction. So there are, there are a lot of books and there are a lot of boxes that we still need to unpack. <laughs> Um, but, uh, books have just always been around me and, uh, I keep them. I mean, I, I buy books. I also go to the library. I used to frequently go to the library before the pandemic hit, uh, since the library reopened here, I've only been once, uh, there was just something I really wanted to, to get. And so I, I went and saw, it, and it's just interesting to see all the new protocols, uh, that are in place to try to keep everyone safe. But, I just love it. As a, as a child, that was like my favorite place to go. And I, I remember having to get special permission. I, I don't remember how old I was, but I remember hearing something about Anne Frank and I, I wanted to get, read the diary of Anne Frank. So I wanted to go check it out at the library, but it was not in the child's, in the children's section. It was in the adult section. So I still remember having to talk to the librarian about it. And I guess she, figured I was mature enough and she let me check that book out. And now you can imagine what all kids can access so fast from anywhere in the world. Uh, we're gonna play a little excerpt from this uh, episode that you picked out, episode 36, set it up for us please and I'll hit play. Okay, this is uh, T. Kira Madden. She wrote a memoir about um, growing up in some really uh, rough circumstances. Uh, she grew up actually spent part of her childhood here in South Florida. Uh, she came from a very well-to-do family, but both of her parents had substance abuse issues. And so she writes about what that was like uh, growing up um, without the proper supervision. Okay, so uh, shall I play it right from the start here? We'll play uh, it you can if you want. I'm, I, um, I'm sorry I didn't get to cut these. That's clips. okay. Don't worry. Please don't worry. This is we just want to get a flavor. So you tell okay, us. Okay. Yeah, you can. You can start. I mean, this okay. is a pretty intense one. I don't. Okay. <clears throat> I know. I know it gets more intense. Uh, about you know, as you said, in the, about the fifteen minute mark. So here we'll just play the first two. Okay. Or three. And when we do that, we'll give you a chance to catch your breath and. 
we'll take you off camera so you can also share with your friends and family as well while we're doing that. Okay. Thank you. So here we go. I'm just going to hit play. Uh, let's see. Cast is brought to you by the Miami Book Fair International. Eight days each November and all year round with writing workshops, author events, and more. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Read More Podcast, the show that brings readers and writers together. I'm Marva Hinton. Recently, I sat down with Takira Madden at the Freedom Tower in downtown Miami to discuss her memoir, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, which was published earlier this month. Takira's memoir includes the graphic depiction of a rape. Listeners who find discussion about sexual assault triggering may want to fast forward through that portion of our interview, starting at around the 15 minute mark. You grew up here in South Florida, in Boca Raton in the 90s and early aughts. Your family was very wealthy and you didn't lack for material things yet your life was still very troubled. Both of your parents had serious substance abuse issues. You're also biracial. Your dad was a white Jewish man and your mom is of Chinese and Hawaiian descent. And you struggle a bit to fit in. From an early age, you were taking care of yourself because of your parents' alcoholism and drug use. And you were put into some pretty dangerous situations because of this. But somehow you managed to come out on the other side and you're very successful now. When you think about your life and everything you went through and what you're doing now, do you call yourself a survivor? Sorry, taking a moment. That's a really uh, beautiful question. Um, I like the word survivor. Um, I think in the end, this book is about resilience. I think because of the title, and I love the title as well. People tend to think of it before they read the book as a male-centric or father-centric book um, for father or lack of father. But in the end, through the writing of it, I realize this book is about resilience and specifically the resilience of women, in my opinion. You write a lot about secrets in this book that shaped you both as a child and even now as an adult, you also reveal a lot of family secrets in this memoir. Were you ever worried about how your family and friends would react to this? Absolutely, it's a task I took incredibly seriously. Um, writing is my job and it's a job I consider the greatest privilege of my life, writing and teaching. And because of that, and I think everyone is different, there's no there's no end all be all answer for all memoirists or writers. But in my case, I had to make a decision of um, who, who I wanted to consult, uh, who I wanted to ask permissions versus to show them pages and say, what do you think of this? Did I, did I get you right? Did I get the situation right? In my specific particular case and story, I decided that my mom mattered to me and my brothers. Um, so those were the people I went to with the work early on. My mom, most of all, she's the one I asked for permission from day one before I started writing until I turned in the final copy. Um, even post galleys, I was considering anything she wanted changed. Um, but it was a really important dialogue for us to have over the past three and a half years of revisiting memories, some in which we never wanted to kick up those memories again. And really discussing the responsibility of bringing those family secrets to light, things that we've never brought into the room before, I was now going to bring in the room through literature. And ultimately we decided um, that it, it was a positive thing, that these things didn't need to be uh, continually buried and buried and buried and buried, and that by I hope providing a beating heart and pulse behind the people in the story and a larger context that it could be accepted finally and brought into that room in a, in brought into the room with love, I suppose. We're just going to pause there. What a wonderful interview. T. Kira Madden interviewed by Marva Hinton, our guest today on my show. We were listening to her show. It's called the Read More Podcast. So everyone, please check it out. T. Kira Madden is the uh, author of Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls. And this was the interview. And you can find 
this and all the podcasts at readmorepodcast.com. And we're going to resume our conversation with Marva Hinton in just a minute. In the meantime, everybody, please share and post with your friends, tag them so they can join us and tell us also what are you reading and what do books mean to you during the pandemic? I'm going to ask Marva that question when Marva's on Twitter, Marva A. Hinton, Marva A. A. Hinton on Twitter. So please follow her there as well and check out readmorepodcast.com. We have lots of comments that have come in and we will read them. So I'm going to bring Marva back onto the stage with me so we can chat about uh, books and about her wonderful podcast. So here she is. I hope she caught her breath and also had a chance to share and interact with her friends online. And here she is. Hi, welcome back. Hi, Sri. What was it like to hear yourself and that very important, very moving conversation with Tikira again? You know, it was nice to hear that um, because I like that I get to talk about important issues and things that are difficult, um, difficult but important. Uh, I think she is just incredibly brave to talk about what happened to her um, as a sexual assault survivor, um, but also as someone who just survived a pretty rough childhood. I mean, as I mentioned there, I mean, she grew up in a very well-to-do family, but there were so many problems. And I think that just goes to say, or goes to show rather, that you can't always tell what's going on with someone from the outside. I mean, they may live in a, a big home and drive fancy cars, but you know there can be some real turmoil going on sometimes in those households. And I think that's important to show. And it's also important to show that she came out of it on the other side and she's a very successful uh, writer now and is doing well despite that rough upbringing that she had. Thank you. And that's what writers do, right? They're able to put it, all of that into their books. And then when they talk about it, some of them might not be as comfortable talking as they are writing. What else did you learn with all these author interviews? I've also done a bun bunch of author interviews, at least 40 uh, authors or so, but uh, it's very different when you're using radio and audio and the podcasting. This video stuff, I think, throws people off and is a different, less intimate, even though we can see each other, it's less intimate than radio. Well, I think what I've learned is that a lot of them, sometimes, especially if it's a, a bigger name author, I get a little bit nervous talking to them, you know, and I think, oh my, I'm going to, this person is, is so accomplished and so smart and oh my goodness, what is it going to be like? And I find out that a lot of times they're just, they're regular people, you know, maybe they're nervous about doing an interview. And I, I was, why are you nervous talking to me? You know, you're this uh, uh, big time author, but I, I find that some of them are incredibly shy. Uh, they, I, I guess they like to speak on the page. Um, and some of them are just really open. I mean, I have, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Ed Weege Donica was my first guest. And we were, before the pandemic hit, we were going to do uh, another interview. We ended up eventually doing it by phone. Um, but before the uh, pandemic hit, she would offer to just have me come to her house to do the interview because she is, she's a local here in South Florida. And that's what I mean about just being so open and uh, really kind and uh, helpful, very encouraging to me. That's, that's great. And I, I think it, it feels to me like South Florida has a lot of writers, right? Like people like to live there, the weather's good, uh, and uh, you're surrounded by interesting people doing interesting things. Oh, definitely. I think it's there's a, it might surprise people who are not uh, familiar with the region, but there is a big literary scene here. As I mentioned, we have a large independent bookstore called Books and Books. Uh, we also have this huge uh, book fair every year um, that brings people from all over the world normally. Um, but as with so many other things, this year it's going to be an all virtual event. 
Um, so we are, I, I think it's the good weather, as you said, that attracts people, but also just, it's a kind of a quirky place. I mean, and everyone talks about how odd uh, Florida is, but South Florida has its own um, sort of odd personality, you know, um, very, they're like so many other places. I mean, there is um, great uh, wealth inequality here. I mean, we have some very, you know, high end um, communities and some people who are really struggling. Um, there's still a lot of, there are a lot of different cultures that come together here. Um, but also makes this a very interesting place to live. That's so interesting to hear about about that for folks who may not know this as well as you do. Let's take a look at some of the comments that have been coming in. Jonathan Borstein's watching from the East Village. He's watched 213 episodes in a row. Oh, wow. and, <laughs> <Super fan. laughs> that's the right the right that's the right thing to say. He's also an incredibly well-read person. So great to have him here. Uh, Prednia is watching from Silver Spring, Maryland. By the way, uh, do you have a favorite memory of New York you want to share with us? You know, Sri, I have uh, haven't been to New York. I'm ashamed to say since I was a little kid, I haven't been. Wow. I, uh, so I, I need to get back to New York. Uh, but yeah, I haven't been there since I was a little kid. And what I remember for that trip from as a little kid growing up in a small town in North Carolina, I had never like ridden in a cab before. And I was think thought it was like so exciting. Well, yeah, as you know, there, there in the old days, meaning before March, there are all kinds of wonderful like podcast festivals and all of that. So when they, when they're back, we've got to get you up here. Oh, and definitely. Special reason too, uh, definitely. To be here. I want to make it up there. I just, it's just like I said, it just hasn't happened. And uh, tell us uh, about uh, Washington DC area memory. Washington DC area. Well, I've been to a lot of conferences there in Washington DC. I also have family that lives there. Um, both my brother-in-law and his family and my sister-in-law and her family live there. So we get up there quite a bit to visit with them. Um, but it just seems like there's always a conference going on in DC. So uh, I get there for conferences. Um, probably the, the biggest memory though I have is that when uh, President Obama had his first inauguration, uh, I was there for that and I got to cover um, that for the station I was working for at the time. And that was just, I am still, it was just such an amazing thing to see, just to be among so many people. It was just, it was quite an event. I remember watching it on TV and just seeing those, remember the later on, eight years later, there'll be, there'll be a discussion about the crowd size, but that first inauguration, that crowd, and in the cold, no less, I, I'm sure you, you, oh, you it, was, it was January yeah, and it was cold. Yeah, I remember that. Um, that day. Ashok is watching from Kerala in India. Have you been to India or Asia? I have not. Um, it's interesting. My husband spent some time in India while he was working on a project. And uh, oh my goodness, Ugh, I hate, I can't remember the city that he That's was okay. in. It's but okay. uh, he seemed to really enjoy his time. He was there for a while working on a project. And he said it was just kind of interesting to meet uh, so many people there and see the differences uh, in the culture. Um, just one thing I remember he always tells me is that no one that he met actually believed he was an American um, because they would think if they see, you know, uh, a black person in India, they assume that you are from Africa. So he had said he had to kind of go through that uh, with everyone he met, but that he uh, really enjoyed his time over there. So maybe we can, when the pandemic ends and we can start traveling and we can figure out uh, maybe we could go over there with the family just to give the kids because our kids haven't had a chance to travel internationally yet. Yeah, I'm not sure. India is always the best place to start for uh, for the first international trip. But along the way, if you went to a couple of other places, I think it would be awesome. I, I, will, I will say that in India, there are um, thousands of African students that come and work, uh, study there and uh, go get college degrees in many parts of the country mostly in the north, but also in the big metros and uh, the metropolitan cities. And so uh, that's probably why, because you don't really meet a lot of African-Americans and that might be uh, part of the reason. Uh, let's see, 
Uh, we have lots of people saying hello, including Stefan Kaplan says, wonderful to be here from Ramsey, New Jersey. And look at what Pradnya is doing. She's tagging friends after friends after friends, which is just uh, including authors like Tanya James and Asim Chabra, who would be wonderful guests on your show. And, oh, yeah. And uh, for my husband was in um, Hyderabad. Is that Hyderabad. 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 Yes. Like, Hyderabad. That's where he was for a while. Yeah. It's a uh, home of wonderful tourists. Uh, and to tourism and culture, but also fabulous food. And uh, always jealous when people get to go to Hyderabad. Uh, Fernando says hello from LA. How about an LA memory for us? Oh, okay. Um, LA, I remember I was out in uh, LA, which I just, I think that's a beautiful part of the country. Like I love uh, Santa Monica. I just think that's such a beautiful community. But I remember I was there in December and I was so cold. I mean, maybe this was unusual because uh, I hear it's supposed to be, I was thinking it would be like Florida weather. Maybe I just happened to be there at a bad time, but it was so cold. I, I remember I wanted to see the Pacific Ocean. So I went and I, I didn't even get, I had planned that even though it was winter, I thought, well, I can still get, I know. I did not get in the water, it was freezing. So that's my uh, memory of LA and also being extremely, uh, uh, lots of traffic, and I didn't feel uh, so comfortable uh, driving because I didn't really know where I was going. And I said, mm, I don't know if that, <laughs> if that part of it's for me, but I did enjoy it. I actually went to a grad school program out there at Antioch University, Los Angeles. Um, that's where I got my MFA. So I, I spent uh, a lot of time out there for those two years, and it was a uh, like I said, beautiful part of the country, but I didn't understand why is it cold in December? Because I'm used to Florida. It's never cold here. Oh, I have a theory because I'm always cold in LA, always. And that's because from growing up and watching all these surfer movies and beaches and things like that, you think it's permanent summer and LA gets cold. I mean, it's colder than you think. And that's what makes it really cold. And that's what, that's what it's about, especially if you're down by the water. And so you experience that as well. My mom's watching from Kerala in India. Hi, Amma, love you. Uh, great to uh, talk to you this morning and then to talk to you here. And then Charles is watching. Charles and Mary are watching from Chicago. I'll ask you for a Chicago memory. Charles is not just a, uh, a viewer. He is also a sponsor and an author. His oh, nice. book is called The Inventor in You. And uh, it's about how you can reinvent yourself and invent, uh, you know, uh, invent things you wouldn't even know that you had ideas and it's a fabulous book it's about it's a step-by-step -step guide to your first invention and he's watching from chicago so give us a chicago uh memory please well i don't have unfortunately i don't have any good uh chicago memories i've never really visited chicago i've only been there like for layovers and so it was never really enough time <laughs> to do anything fun um so that's somewhere i'd i like to visit another great american city uh that i definitely want to visit once the pandemic is over and we can actually travel again. I hear you. And Karthik says hello and good morning because it's already, of course, morning in India. And here's Pradnya still tagging away all these folks. And Olinda is listening from Goa in India. Speaking of beaches and a beautiful part of India, Goa is a fabulous place to go. Uh, here's a question about children's literature and other languages from around the world to bridge the gap of understanding between parentage and new generation. So he's asking a question about children's literature. Uh, have you had a chance to talk well, to have, children's authors? Yes, I've had a couple of children's authors on. Um, usually I have people on who write uh, YA or young adult fiction. Um, occasionally I've had some people who write middle grade, which is kind of for, for tweens. I haven't really had anyone who writes for the little kids since the show is um, primarily for adults. I mean, there are a lot of adults who like to read YA, which I think is so important because it really helps you stay in tune with what's going on for, for, with young people. Um, there, it's just kind of puts you right there because so many times as adults, we don't really know what's going on with uh, teenagers. Um, you know, we think we do, we remember what it was like for us, but it's, things are very different now. And I find that reading that material helps me to feel like I can relate to uh, kids that age. Um, the middle grade that I've read, I just, 
so enjoyed it. I think I sent you a clip. Um, Pablo Cartaya, he's someone I've had on a couple of times. He writes great books uh, for kids in that um, middle grade, that like nine to 12 uh, range. And I, I think that's important. And I think it's important. He, he talked about diversity and uh, literature in various languages. Um, I know that my daughter really enjoyed a book that we had, just kind of a, a silly book, when she was a little bit younger called uh, Yummy Yucky, that was talking about all these things and it would give the kids the word in English as well as in Spanish for various things with it. And um, right now I just, of course, can't, <laughs> I can't, I'm in trouble remembering like the different things, but it would, it would be like, you know, good things to eat, like fruits. And they would talk about like also smelly socks and, you know, kids love um, silliness like that. And it also helps them, of course, build their vocabulary. It, it really does when they can get to be silly. So tell us about this and I'll play Pablo Cartaya's book. I mean, I'll play the podcast. Okay. Um, the one I sent you, I'm trying to, uh, I think the one I sent you was uh, Marcus Vega, uh, doesn't speak Spanish. Um, and I think, I, I, think I, I only have access to the the full, yeah, that's the one, Marcus, but yeah. You're, yeah, you're right. and there's like a link there if you wanted to play or just let people see, but yeah. um, it was about uh, a boy who uh, was part of a, a Latinx family. I believe they were from Puerto Rico, um, but they living uh, in really the Boston area and he, his family travels back to Puerto Rico and he feels embarrassed because, you know, he, this is his culture, but he doesn't really speak Spanish very well. And he's embarrassed about that. And he doesn't know, like when he's in his home, he's different because, you know, he does come from this Latinx family in an area that's not very diverse. But when he goes to Puerto Rico and he's surrounded by family and, and friends and he doesn't feel like he quite belongs there because he doesn't speak Spanish well. And I thought that was such an important issue to present for kids because we see that sometimes with kids who, you know, maybe mom and dad speak um, whatever the, the native language is for the family. But in some cases, they don't want the kids to speak that because they want the kids to learn English and speak English very well. And I, I just happened to remember working with a woman who was in that situation before. And I know it was a source of embarrassment for her because people would you know, see her and see her name and, and walk up to her and think she could speak Spanish. And she just didn't quite feel comfortable with it. So I think it's cool for kids to get a book like that because maybe they're in that situation where they can see, you know, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's something that you can um, work on if that's what you uh, want to do. Um, but I, I've, I just feel like books like that help kids to feel less alone about their situations. I, I hear I hear you and I understand it wasn't perfect timing with that question from Fernando. Let's play this uh, clip and uh, we'll just go from here. Let's take a look. Let's take a listen. This episode of the Read More podcast is brought going to, to bounce ahead. Of the same bird. Um, so going back there is feels feels like I'm I'm visiting a relative, um, and and so I really wanted to to set the story there. Um, I'm I love the island, and and I'm also heartbroken in many ways for the island. Um, not just not just for the the hurricane that that devastated um, so many lives. But, but also the way that the mainland U.S. Um, responds to the, the people living in Puerto Rico and, and, and a lot of the unfortunate politics that, that take place um, as a result of just bad policies. Uh, so I wanted to really show, show the island um, for its beauty, but also the complexity that it has. And, and I was really proud of the response that I got for the novel. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a story about the discovering your identity and, and many young people, people really in general, they, they go, uh, many, many years without realizing parts of their identity, um, 
that has been lost. Um, and so, you know, you get a kid who is, who, who was born in Puerto Rico, but has not lived there, doesn't speak Spanish and, and then goes back and begins to discover parts of his identity that that was lost or that he didn't know. Um, and so I, I really I really wanted to explore that aspect of the, dis the discovery of, of identity and using a place like Puerto Rico as as the, the backdrop for, for that discovery. Well, what is it about that loss of language that you wanted to explore? Because you know, I've heard about situations sometimes where a Latino kid may not learn Spanish because his parents don't want or want to focus on English because, you know, especially if you're here in the mainland U.S., you think, well, my kid needs to learn English. And then the language is lost. And sometimes, like with Marcus, you are you find a kid who is embarrassed because they don't speak the language. Yeah, you know, I'm going to pause there. The book is called Marcus Vega Doesn't Speak Spanish by the children's author Pablo Cartaya being interviewed by Marva Hinton. And everyone, please check out readmorepodcast.com to get the full access to all the shows and so that you can learn more about not just Pablo's work, but also these great interviews that are done by Marva. And uh, again, uh, it was just great to hear uh, him speaking and talking uh, about books and just getting deep diving, getting this deep dive into books must be so much fun. So tell me how people who want to be on your show, how they reach you, how they interact with you. Um, do publicists like chase you down? How does this work? Um, that does happen now. Now that I've been doing the show for a while, occasionally I will get publicists who will reach out to me who will send me an email or a lot of times though, it's through social media. People will come and say, Hey, um, I have an author I think would be good for your show. And, you know, we can kind of talk about that. Sometimes people have uh, self published books, you know, they will reach out to me that way. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to me because I get, I don't know how these people, sometimes they find me because sometimes I get an email, like, as I mentioned, I do, um, editing work and I'll get like a, an email to my work email. I'm like, how did these people find me? And uh, it'll be about a book that uh, they think would be interesting for my listeners. So um, that's always nice. But I always say that the, the quickest way, the best way to reach me is I am on Twitter. It feels like 24 seven. So <laughs> if, if someone wants to just um, send me a, a tweet um, at Marva A. Hinton, um, we can get together. We can talk about these things. I mean, I also have um, a Facebook page uh, for Read More, and you know, you can uh, contact me through the uh, readmorepodcast.com page as well if people want to reach out and get on the show or or just leave a comment. I mean, uh, one of the things that, that I do on the show, just to let everybody know, is every uh, time there's a show, I do a giveaway for the book that I talk about. So. Uh, just a moment, if I could show you something. Let me see if you don't mind me looking around. Um, let's see. I've got, this uh, is the book. Hold on, I'm gonna give you one shot here. Hold on, there you go. Okay, uh, Prayer for the Living by Ben Okri. He's gonna be the, the next guest I'm gonna have on. And after that's over, I will, once the episode goes live, I will always put a trivia question on the website about the book and people can respond to me either on Twitter or Facebook. The first person to get the answer, uh, to answer the question correctly, I will send them a book. So I just had that happen today. I had a new uh, show come out today with uh, Claudia Rankin. Uh, her new book is Just Us, An American Conversation. Uh, and this is one of the rare uh, nonfiction uh authors I have on. I mean, she's a, a poet and essayist and she writes about important topics concerning race and the show just came out this morning. Uh, it came out like uh, eight o'clock this morning. And by this afternoon, someone had already you know, answered the question and I'll be sending them a book uh, very shortly. So it's a good way to get a uh, get, get free book. Um, before the pandemic, I when I interviewed authors in person, I always had them sign a book so that I could, you know, give them something that would be 
um, you know, they couldn't just go out and buy. Um, of course, now because of the pandemic, the books aren't signed, but still, it's always nice to get a free book. I agree. That sounds wonderful. And that's the new episode by Claudia uh, with Claudia Rankin. And mm -hmm. you can find it right on uh, readmorepodcast.com. Before, before we go, let's just take, take a look at some more of the comments that have been coming in. And uh, let's see here. This is so many comments. I'm just trying to catch up here. Uh, John, Fernando has already tagged other friends. Jonathan said, when I was a kid, I wanted to ride in the jump seats and check her cabs, but was not allowed to. And um, uh, just, I love how people are, are, are tagging friends. And then Ashok is telling you to tell your husband, I guess, that Hyderabadi Biryani is famous and he also loves reading. And please come to Kerala after the crisis. And, Ro <laughs> and Rose Horowitz, one of our producers is here at Rose Horowitz 31. She's live tweeting from Milford, Connecticut. I see you had Claudia Rankin on a recent read more. I have to listen. Toni Morrison is also perhaps my favorite American novelist. So that is that is cool. They're asking for the podcast link. It's readmorepodcast.com. Readmorepodcast.com. Chicago is awesome, says Terry White Robinson. And some of the best writing today is in the young adult field, says uh, Jonathan. And um, uh, Ashok says, erstwhile Russian literature and especially children's literature is famous and interesting. And Mara, uh, Linda says, hello, Marva. This issue with kids losing their identity, mostly language traditions, is such a common thread. And uh, Daryl says, on the flip side, some people spend their entire lifetime studying their identity and seeking every little bit of record. Hi, Marva. I want to suggest a guest for your podcast. Ayana Villabus is a 14-year-old who has already written four books. You can reach out to her mother, Dimple Willibus, right here on Facebook. And uh, and he's also putting in the Read More podcast. Okay, I that. That. Thank yeah. you. And Alinda says, truly enjoying the discussion. Well, we're talking about books, and that's why I'm kind of jealous that all Marva does is uh, is talk about books. On our show, we talk about everything from politics to health, and uh, uh, it would be fun to just focus on books, especially fiction, because you are able to travel the world as you read and talk about fiction. In in our episodes, we have done a lot of work around uh, creativity during the pandemic. And what uh, the authors must be finding very difficult to not have the book tour, not not have even, I mean, I'm, but some of them are telling me that they're writing more than ever because they have nowhere to go. Is that what you're hearing as well? I'm kind of hearing a mix. Uh, some people, like you said, they are writing more because there's no, like you said, nowhere to go, um, not much else to do. But then other people have said, like, for example, we just talked about uh, Claudia Rankin. She has said that she's not been able to write uh, during the pandemic uh, because it's just there's so much going on because it's not just uh, the pandemic. There have been all the, the protests and, um, you know, just uprisings in, in cities across the country uh, as people um, protest uh, against inequality in this country and they're you know seeing so many people get sick and that she just felt like it was very difficult for her to work and so she said she's been focusing on her family and uh just, just spending more time with her family than she has in a very long time as far as missing out on the book tours uh some of the writers i've talked to say but I still got a chance to maybe go some places and do some things I would not have done otherwise through, you know, video conferencing. So, I mean, and getting more people are getting to see them that way than would be able to show up at say any individual bookstore. So I, I feel like writers are finding uh, some pluses and minuses to this uh, quiet time. I, I can I can believe that it it really depends on the person and their circumstances and do they have kids running around the house and uh, things like that for sure. I'm going to uh, just tell people what we have coming up. In the meantime, I'm going to after that I'm going to come to you for some final thoughts and also since you've done so much reading, maybe uh, some book recommendations uh, for people looking for ideas and maybe mix it up a little bit, a couple of different genres. So I'll give you a moment to do that. In the meantime, let me. Just tell everybody what's happening. It's now 10 p.m. Eastern at 9 a.m. Eastern, meaning in about 11 hours, we have a terrific show. Lauren Freyer 
covers India. She is NPR's India correspondent. She's visiting the US at the moment. And we'll also listen to her recent episode on Rough Translation, a great podcast with Greg Warner, How to Be an Anti-Castist. And we will be meeting Lauren tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern. So please do connect with her and watch us on all these platforms. We have a busy day tomorrow. After that, we have our summit with IA Impact. It's called the Impact Summit 2020. Four congressional members of Congress will be there, as well as civil rights leaders and entertainers. 30 guests will be speaking. It's a free event. Please sign up if you haven't already. The link is on the bottom right, iaimpact.org slash summit, iaimpact.org slash summit. Both Mina Harris and Maya Harris will be there uh, from the uh, vice presidential candidates family and all these great experts and speakers. So please join us, iaimpact.org slash summit. Look on the lower right and you can sign up uh, for that free conference. And so that's on Saturday. On Sunday morning, we read the New York Times out loud like we have for five years. And we'll have a New York Times obituary writer with us and previous New York Times and theater and TV critic, Neil Genslinger will be with us. He's also a Rett syndrome parent talking about that particular condition with his uh, family. And uh, we'll also be doing a tribute to the great writer who passed away, the journalist Jim Dwyer, died on Wednesday, and we will be talking about him, and Dan Barry will be here to talk about him for a few minutes with us. So that's at 8.30 a.m. on Sunday, and then at 11 a.m. on Sunday, we host a show that I am honored to executive produce along with my friends, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Korean, their co-hosts of She's On Call, surgeons talking about COVID and so much more at She's On Call on Facebook and Twitter. They'll have guests Tamara Lewis and Miranda Van Tilburg will be here. One is a neonatologist and another is a psychologist. So please join us on Sunday morning at 11, at 11 a.m. Eastern. And then at night, we will have Art Heals the World, episode 215 of this show. We do Sunday Night Positivity and we're doing it as we talk about an extraordinary auction to help poor kids in India. So please tune in for all of that this week. We don't uh, take time off on the weekends here, as you can hear. Now, you're ready to hear some great final thoughts and suggestions from our friend Marva Hinton. Please follow her at Marva A. Hinton on Twitter. You can find her on Facebook. And you can also check out readmorepodcast.com. And here's Marva. Well, Sri, I just want to thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, and also, you asked me for a couple of book recommendations. So I, a couple of things I want to um, mention right now to people. Uh, if you like fiction, I think you should uh, really check out uh, Ya Jesse's Transcendent Kingdom, a very, very good book. She's going to be on the show in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you like short stories, uh, again, uh, Prayer for the Living is very good um, by Ben Okri. I would definitely say check that out. Um, another short story collection. I'm sorry, just throwing these up. Um, I love this, it. Please keep going. The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Disha Filia. Uh, sorry, I'm not holding that up correctly. Uh, but that's just a, a very uh, interesting book. It looks at uh, some of the things that kind of go on. Hold behind. it up for another mm -hmm. second. People will take photographs or take notes, so just hold it up. Oh, again. okay, sure, sure. This is very. This is a really good book. I, I just have started this one, but I'm really enjoying it. Um, it talks about some of the. Um, We're missing her first name. Can you just your finger? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm not. Uh, Disha D E E S H A Philia P H I L Y A W. The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. Really, really good. Sure. Um, and also, we talked about international writers. Uh, ben Okri is, uh, was born in Nigeria, and he spent part of his childhood in London, and that's where he lives right now. A very interesting man. And if you like magical realism, you're going to like these. If you like uh, flash fiction, I mean, you know, the really short stories, you'll like it. And there are also some stories in here that are just 
flat out weird, but very interesting. You know, he has a very interesting perspective on things. So definitely that's a good one. Um, just a second. I'm sorry. This is kind of awkward because I, I have, a, have a stack of books um, on my... You should tweet out a photograph of that stack at some point. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It's very awkward looking at it like this. Uh, again, oh, she was just on, uh, but I have to hold the computer up correctly now. Uh, just us, really. You've got to get this. This nice. is about having difficult conversations about race. Um, and she mentions how hard that is and, and kind of what the result was when she decided to just just do it, you know, just go up and talk to people and also to talk to your friends about it because so many times, I mean, it's a tough subject, you know, uh, we, we just kind of like to avoid it, but she talks about what happens when you do have the conversation and when you, it's kind of like, Sri, do you remember that old, old show that used to come on MTV, you know, the real world? Um, I was sure. trying to remember their tagline, you know, uh, basically, um, so stop being polite, start getting real. I think that's what it was. Um, she talks about how that's how we can kind of uh, meet each other in the middle and, and become a, a better society when we, we just put ourselves out there and are not afraid to have these conversations. Oh, that's a great reason to read that book. And uh, uh, there's a quick question here. Uh, Linda says, I need a photo uh, of the stack. And uh, please give us time for the screenshots. If that's why you are holding the books up longer. Oh, Rose I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, Rose was wondering if you, uh, uh, how do you do this? Do you have like sponsors or advertisers or how do, or do you do this a labor of love? How do you it, do this? It is totally a labor of love. I mean, I have tried to, <laughs> I've tried to figure out how to monetize this. I just, I'm not quite there yet. Um, I have had some sponsorship by the Miami Book Fair International, by them letting me use their offices and things for interviews in the past, which is very, very helpful, and I appreciate that. Um, but I'm, I'm not really making any money. I mean, I do have a link where people, if they're interested, they can buy um, books on my website, and a very small percentage comes, like a very, very small. Um, <laughs> I, 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 it's very, very small. I have yet to, to make any money. You have to like. Uh, I guess people buy so many to yeah. where you get something. So I, I have yet to make any money through there. But, you know, if people would, are so inclined, uh, they can buy any of the books that we talk about on the show on the website. So I'll definitely send out a, a tweet of these. This It's just so messy. I don't really want, like to show it. But <laughs> I, I, I can do that. Well, thank you so much. And we know that Passion Projects, when you, 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 you're doing it not for the money, but you're doing it for these great conversations. You always wanted to have this platform and now you do. And I know that it's a, its own reward, but you're helping so many people as well, along with the authors. Folks, our guest has been Marva Hinton. She's on Twitter at Marva A. Hinton. Please find her, please follow her. And Marva, thank you so much for your time, your good energy that you're sharing with us and the fact that you get to live and breathe books what a what a blessing that is! Oh, Sri, thank you so much for having me on. I I really appreciate it, and uh, also thanks to everybody who's watched tonight. Thank you, and we'll let you get back to your family and uh, and ask your husband about the food he ate. Oh, he might just be rubbing it in if you do at this point. It may not be fair, right? When you're I'm stuck, to talk about it. So I I mean he constantly he so I'll I'll definitely ask him about the food. Terrific! Thank you very much, Barbara, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. All right, everybody, that was a fabulous show just to be surrounded by books and to talk about books. How lucky is she and how lucky are we that Marva Hinton spent that time with us? Thank you all for being here. Truly grateful to you. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow, 9 a.m. Eastern. Lauren Freyer will be with us from National Public Radio. She is the India correspondent visiting the U.S. for a bit. And so she'll be here and talk about all kinds of interesting aspects of her life and work. Thank you as always. Please email me, sri at sri.net, if you have any questions or comments. We'd love to be in touch and we'd love to collaborate on these episodes. We're now approaching episode 215 and we plan to go live every single day, at least through the elections, and then we'll see uh, how it goes. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you soon. And good night, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye bye.